Thank you for joining us today for the three surprising truths about caregiving for an aged loved one. Just know that our next session is going to be June 1st, which is we are going to be running these uh, series every first Thursday of the month. And the next one in June is called Who Took My Purse and Emptied My Closet? Um, dealing with um, our um, challenges with caring for a loved one with dementia. Um, so also, I wanted to let you know, please put in the chat um, maybe the best time available for you for these webinars. We're still kind of testing this out. So if you can put in the chat, if morning, afternoon, evening is best time for you, so we can get a feedback on that. Uh, my name is Paige Fairbanks Gunn. I'm the relationship manager for Kelsch Communities in the Arizona region. I've been working with seniors since 1997 and have worked with over 4,000 families. Kelsch Communities operates in eight different states. We're family owned and operated, and we have exceptional care throughout our 24 hour on site nursing and assisted living and all memory care. We offer independent assisted memory care, respite care, day stay services, and lots of resources, including our speaker today. Our speaker today is a national caregiver, caregiving speaker and consultant. She provides a path to relieve the fear, anxiety, and overwhelm that family members experience when a loved one is diagnosed with dementia. She is the founder of the Alzheimer's Family Consulting. She's a certified senior advisor, certified dementia practitioner, and is certified in dementia care. She is also the author of the highly rated, It's Not That Simple, Helping Families Navigate the Alzheimer's Journey, which is based on Pam's 14 year dementia and Alzheimer's caregiving journey with her parents. Please welcome Pam Ostrowski. Thanks so much, Paige. I appreciate it. And thank you to Kelsch Communities for sponsoring these monthly family caregiving webinars because we all are challenged with this journey. And one of the, the biggest things that I see in our situation is that we struggle with being caregivers. And a lot of times it's, you know, I remember when my parents would have doctor's appointments and we would schedule them, thank goodness they let us do this, uh, back to back. So that when uh, mom would have hers and then dad would have his and they'd be in their little gowns in two rooms next to each other. And I would run between the two <laughs> rooms trying to hear what the doctor had to say, make sure that mom understood it, dad understood it. And it's a logistical, you know, it's like those clown cars where people just keep coming out of them. It's just, it's crazy. And I'm sure that you guys are encountering that same thing. Uh, as you go through the caregiving journey for an older loved one, whether it's a spouse or, or whether you're a son or a daughter. And so uh, I wanted to make sure that we talked about all three situations because, you know, people have different engagements uh, with, with our, their um, adult aging loved ones. And I, I just thought that it was important for us to, here's my mom. I didn't include my dad in this picture. I should add him in because it makes it look funny that <laughs> just me and mom, but mom had dementia and Alzheimer's for 14 years. Her journey was much longer than my dad's. Uh, my dad had vascular dementia the last couple of years of his life. And, you know, a lot of that was due just to old age, but the vascular part of it was more related to his congestive heart failure and its progression. So uh, I wrote a book, as Paige mentioned, uh, about it's not that simple, helping families navigate the Alzheimer's journey. In reality, it's a caregiving guide, and it doesn't matter whether your loved one has dementia or not. Uh, there are still many things like care options and communication and visiting that are applicable to anyone's journey. So let's get talking about those three surprising truths, because we all know it's manic, right? We all are panicking and feeling guilty and that type of thing. But there's, we're going to cover caregiving challenges that we don't expect to run into and how to manage those. And then I just thought of another one. So hopefully I'll remember uh, being an overwhelmed caregiver. Hello, guilt. So you're overwhelmed, but you really need a break. And I have two clients right now because they do one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting with uh, family members. Two of them, uh, one took a vacation to the 
to Cabo, Mexico, two weeks ago, and another one took uh, uh, um, out in Virginia Beach. She took a few days off with her husband. And uh, we really tried to tee it up so that the moms and dads were all busy and occupied and had people checking in so that they could really, truly relax. And Paige mentioned respite. Um, and maybe she can cover that uh, in a little bit about what, what is respite in a care community. And then finally, if you don't have these tips that I'm going to share at the end, uh, your world and your journey with caregiving can be a lot more complicated. And then, of course, I'd like you to stay to the end to take advantage of an amazing offer that's worth $125. Um, this is the webinar dates for and topics. The topics are open to what you want to talk about. We put them in here as... Um, as placeholders. But if you want to talk about something else, if something else is top of mind, we can cover pretty much anything between the two of us. So uh, just email me. I put my, my email in the chat. Uh, and Paige, if you could do the same, they can, you can email either one of us and just let us know, what do you want to talk about? And then don't forget to include what's the best time of day. We're really trying to get as many people as possible here during the live webinar so that we can answer direct questions. So I just wanna review quickly about what does a caregiver do, right? Because a lot of times I hear people who are uh, in the baby boomer generation saying, oh, well, a caregiver is that person who toilets and showers the individual. And I said, no, that's, that's usually a professional caregiver. It can be a family caregiver. But in reality, a caregiver, a family caregiver, is anyone who has a loved one who has needs, whether it's helping them get groceries, take them to the doctor's offices, uh, you know, any, any kindness, any sort of element of care makes you a caregiver. So you could be a friend or a family member and be a caregiver. You don't have to be a professional caregiver who works for an agency or who works at a care community. So really, it's, it's an informal caregiver versus a professional. So I just wanted to go through that and make sure that we are all on the same page when talking about caregiving. So here we go. The caregiving challenges we don't expect. So we, you know, I don't know if this is, you've run into this or not. And if you have, please put it in the chat. But there's a difference between feeling frustrated occasionally with your loved one and feeling it daily. And especially for those who are showing signs of dementia or cognitive impairment, daily frustration is what a caregiver typically feels. It can be anything from putting a bowl of cereal in front of your loved one and then, you know, not, you know, picking up a fork to eat it or, um, you know, them not understanding what they're supposed to do with the bowl of cereal to even something more functional, which might be there's a doctor's appointment or we're going to the grocery store. You told them to put their shoes on 10 minutes ago and they're sitting there in their nightgown or their jammies, um, not, not ready at all. So, and that can get really frustrating even the first time it happens, let alone the 10th time, right? So we're also, uh, things that we don't expect is our, uh, around learning how to be persuasive. Usually uh, we, we feel that when we make a statement and the other person responds, you, you, know, you either go yes or no. And in reality, if you think about it, every day we're persuading people. When every time you start a question with, do you want, it's do you wanna go for steak or Italian, right? And then the person says Italian. Well, you wanted to go for steak. So you instead say, you know what? We had Italian last week. You know, I'm kinda, I kind of like a steak. What do you say that, you know, we see if we can't get something Italian at the steakhouse, right? So you're starting to provide ways to convince another person why they should go with the direction you would like to go. So we sell and persuade every single day. The challenge is when you have someone with cognitive impairment, your techniques need to be gentle and kind and show, don't tell. So we'll talk a bit about that. Experiencing decision fatigue is another surprising one. We, in reality, it's just exhausting, right? I mean, trying to decide, 
you know, well, uh, who can come and take care of my loved one if you're if they're living at home with you? Who can take care of my loved one while I go to the grocery store? I mean, these are necessities or what I, if I go to my doctor's appointment? So these are things that you can't not do. And again, um, Paige, I, you know, in a minute, I'd like you to speak up about, you know, what is respite care and how can people try out a care community and be able to also get some rest, right? Because frankly, when you go through the things that are listed here, it's really bad for your heart and it's really bad for your brain uh, and your overall health. As a matter of fact, people who care give for those with dementia specifically, they are 60, that's a six zero percent higher, have a higher 60% higher likelihood of having a stroke. So if you are a spouse, similar age to your, your, your one that your loved one that you're caring for, your health is at risk. And if something happens to you, what will happen to them? So we need to keep you healthy and we're here to provide resources to help you get some respite and some time off and allow your brain to relax a little bit and allow your heart to do the same. So the other thing is that we don't think about is project and people management. <laughs> I'll explain more in a bit. And then finding the best resources for your loved one. So that's uh, kind of the, the topics that we're going to, to go through. So let's talk about how we manage each one. So how do we manage feeling daily frustration? So you can see this picture. The woman's helping the man. He's kind of scratching his head. He's looking at, at a computer. I'm not sure what to do. Well, here's the first thing to do. If you're feeling really frustrated let it go. And I know that sounds like, oh, you could say that, but it's really hard to do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, frustration is, is, though, is, is highly connected to wanting to control an outcome. So I always say, do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? And I actually had one client say, I want to be right. And I said, that's not the answer. <laughs> you want to be happy. She's like, no, at this point, I really just want to be right. <laughs> so I thought that was really funny because um, sometimes it feels like it's you that is the person who's being taken care of that you, there's something wrong with you. Uh, but in reality, frustration really is tightly, tightly uh, knit with wanting to get a person to do what you want them to do. If you let go of that and say, does it really matter? So you're going to have to be open-minded and internalize the fact that there are many ways. And I didn't say understand. I didn't say listen. I said internalize, meaning to take within that there are many ways to do things and it doesn't have to be done the exact way you want to. In other words, you have to be flexible. My dad was not flexible and he would get so upset with my mom and me uh, because we weren't doing the things the way that we should in his mind. He's a very efficient person. And what we, you know, mom might not do things, do things quite the most efficient way. And he would, you know, that isn't the way to do it. You need, you should be doing it this way because it makes more sense. So we need to let go of all of that because it, you, it really does bring up a lot of, it increases your heart rate. It creates stress, all the things that are bad for our health. And in reality, does it really matter to, is it, you know, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, are you going to look back on that one event and go, oh my gosh, you know, she did the dishes wrong or she put the dishes in the wrong drawer. Is it really going to matter? No, it's not. So we need to kind of get a grip on what's causing frustration because it's, we, even with, um, that was, uh, this was the one I thought of while I was talking earlier, doctor's offices. We expect doctors to talk with us at length, especially like my dad would talk the ear off of, um, out of off his doctor. And I said, dad, they have to go and do work with other patients. And he's like, well, I just have one more question. And he would bring in a sheet of questions and the doctor didn't plan for that. <laughs> We didn't make 10 appointments. We made one. So, you know, he, he would get frustrated though. And then on the flip side of that is doctors who are too cryptic 
and they speak in medical terms. And it's very confusing to anyone who's accompanying them to the doctor's office. And in addition to that, we expect doctors to always be right. And they aren't always right. We expect them to explain everything to us and maybe they can't or don't have time to. So our expectations, those expectations create frustration. So it's, it's not so much lower your expectations, but take a deep breath and, and look at what you want the outcome to be. Focus on the outcome and how you can be flexible with that outcome. So if you get part of your information, well, see how you can get the rest of it, but don't get frustrated because that's so bad for you. And as a final tip, under frustration, Use, try the using the phrases. If, so if your loved one, I'll give you an example. Uh, a husband and wife are sitting across from each other and the wife is getting really frustrated with the husband. And he's like, I was watching this movie and, and there was that guy and, and he was using his hands to try to describe the, the guy. And she's like, John Wayne, you know, uh, you know he, she, he just listed off a bunch of actors. No, no, that's not it. That's not it. And so he was getting frustrated. She was escalating, right? And instead of saying, you know, can you help me understand? Or how does this work? Or, 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 and I told her, actually, I said, you know what? Just say, give him a big old kiss and say, it doesn't matter, honey. Well, it'll come to us. It just might take a little while. So reassure him that there's nothing wrong with either one of you. She wanted to be right. She wanted to guess what he was talking about. And I was like, wow, you could be there all day. No wonder you're frustrated. Now, learning to be persuasive. So um, I love this picture. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. So when we're, you wouldn't think this would be something that would be part of caregiving, but it's a big part of caregiving when you have siblings involved, um, family members, brothers and sisters of spouses, aunts and uncles, all those people kind of jump in uh, to the caregiving roles and argue about what's right and what's not. So bear in mind that these are relatives, these are family, these are people you're going to see at Christmas and the holidays. So try to put the problem in front of everyone, in front, not between you. Because between you sounds like, well, you said this, or you didn't do that, or you never do anything to help out. So it's very accusatory. Anytime you put that word you in there, you're putting the problem between you and not in front of you. So the next thing is to agree when you meet. And I mentioned this in my book. At the end of each chapter in my book, there's a um, questions that then discussion points that everyone should have that's part of this care team. And I include it, the exact wording that you can use because some people really struggle with, well, how do you start this, these difficult conversations? And one of the things that I start off every discussion topic with is everyone gets to speak. They get two minutes. There's a timekeeper. There's a notes keeper. And then there's someone who kind of manages and moderates and makes sure that everybody plays by the rules. So allow someone to speak without interruption and listen to what they're saying. Be, don't be thinking about how you're going to respond, which is what we typically do. Uh, but in this particular case, when you're talking about caregiving, people have very passionate passionate feelings towards what's happening with their loved one. And if they think differently than you do, then they're going to be at an impasse. So it's better to just listen and process and then say, well, that's an interesting perspective. You can say, I need to think about that because it's too, it's, it's too far away from the way I think. So I need some time to kind of reconcile where I'm coming from and where you're coming from. So let's get together again next week and talk about this. Um, if you have someone who's confused, or if you're confused about how something's going to work, so this happens all the time, uh, you can ask the question, well, how's that going to work? Help me understand. You don't say that's never going to work or that's too complicated, or I don't, you know, you don't know what you're talking about because that's where all adversarial terms. And when we're wound up, when we're frustrated, cue slide before this one, when we're frustrated, we're right on edge. And so we're very accusatory or we can be. So we want to keep everything simple and basically let everyone speak, take notes, understand, but you don't have to agree with them, but you do need to give, be courteous 
and listen to what they have to say. And then the act of being persuasive is you'd be surprised if somebody feels very strongly about getting their way and the person is a family member and not the person that might have cognitive impairment, then you have an opportunity there to, to listen and they, they feel respected. Usually where, um, where conflict comes in is when someone doesn't feel respected. So this gives you the chance to listen and say, okay, I, I understand now what you're saying and I need to figure out how to link it with how I think of this, these things and then let's talk. And that's going to allow that person to back down and then listen to what you think and why you think that way and how you see something working. And that's negotiation, right? That's the art of being persuasive while, you know, so that everybody walks out of an, a discussion happy, which is what we want. We want to be happy as opposed to just right. <laughs> okay, decision fatigue. So how do we manage uh, this whole thing about experiencing decision fatigue and what is decision fatigue? Basically, um, the number of decisions that happen in any one day in your loved one's life when you're caregiving, it's okay, we've got to get them up for breakfast. Do we keep them in their pajamas or do we change them there? Do they go to the bathroom first or do we put them into the shower? What are they going to have for breakfast? Because yesterday they didn't like what they had. Now, what do we have in the refrigerator that they might like? Uh, I mean, and that's, that's three or four things, decisions you have to make in the first five minutes of getting up, right? And the rest of the day is, is even more complex. So what I want you to do is, um, it, I don't know how many of you work and how many of your spouses, but if you work, it's really important for you to do this exercise. And if you uh, are retired and living with your spouse, it's still important to do this because I've seen my spouse clients really just wear themselves down by working themselves to the bone because they're like, well, I have to do this and then I have to do that and I have to vacuum and then I have to clean the house. This is where getting resources and getting help are so important. And there's nothing wrong with getting help. It's not like this is a bad thing. You know, getting help means finally living the life that you've earned and you've deserved, right? Because this is something that's really important to, you have to be in good shape. You have to be strong. You have to be healthy. And if you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, it's really hard to do. So I want you to make a list. So this is the night before the next day, write a list of all the things that have to happen, have to happen, right? Not that you'd like to do. That's a different list, right? So you have the things you have to, that have to happen. Take a look at how long that list is. If it's more than five things, I want you to assign each one a numbered value. One, first priority, two, second priority, three, and so forth. If there are only a few, then you can go to, oh, I'd really like to, and create that list, and then number those in priority as well. Because sometimes the things we really like to do are not that important, and we can delay them to when there's a time slot for us to fit that in. So you take the pressure off and the way the brain works with lists is pretty fascinating. So if you have a bunch of stuff in your head and you're thinking, even in the middle of the night, if you wake up, have a notepad and pen and um, write a note of all the things that you have on your mind. And then in the morning, you can prioritize them. But by doing this the night before your subconscious mind, which never sleeps, will organize and structure and work on how to get all of those things done. If you do it the morning of, then you're less likely, you don't get to take advantage of that brain trust that whatever number of hours you sleep, you know, six, seven, eight hours to have your subconscious mind work on problem solving. So that's why lists are so writing down your list is so important. And then it's time to sit down and maybe sit down with your best friend or, you know, someone like me or Paige and say, look, I, I need some help and I, I don't even know where to start. And we both have resources, um, a lot of crossover because we're both in Phoenix. 
uh, but resources that can help you whittle down those lists and help you out in getting things done and with not wearing yourself to down to the bone. And then remember too, that there's very few decisions unless you're in the hospital um, that you have to make immediately. So it's best to create a, what I call a trigger event plan where whatever's trick, if a trigger would be a, one of the two of you gets sick, one of the two of you falls, um, you're, you know, the other thing is for adult children who are not living near their parents, you know, that's a scary thing, right? Because you don't know what's going on because you're miles away. And as an, as someone who's encountered that, you know, I would call every day, Hey, how you doing? And, and, but you don't really know. And so that sense of the unknown creates a lot of fear. And so by having a plan you have and resources. So you've identified, Hey, could you go over and check on my parents and maybe hang out with them for an hour? Um, you know, now you have reassurance from, you have eyes on your, your loved ones. And that's really important. All right, Paige, get ready. Cause we're going to, we're going to talk about respite. <laughs> um, project and people management skills. Now this sounds like we're having a corporate HR uh, discussion around benefits, right? How do you manage projects and how do you manage people? The bottom line is that this is very relevant in the caregiving conversation and the way that we walk through this journey. So how do we, how do you even learn those things, right? How do you know what to do? Well, again, I mentioned writing things down and organizing them by their need for completion, because that's going to keep you from being this woman who's juggling all these things all at once, right? So again, it's very important to write things down. It's the number one thing project management and people managers actually do. And then what you need to do is identify your resources. So if you're a person who's worked in corporate America or are working in corporate America, you know that you have to to project manage, you've got to look at a timeline and you've got to prioritize. So caregiving is no different if you want to make this journey a little bit easier. So what you can do, and I have a client, um, two sisters that uh, are trying to figure out, you know, we're, they're both exhausted and they have, you know, it's like, okay, well, who's going to do what? And I said, you know what? Let each of you pick. So make the list, all right? Everybody make their own list. Make sure you have one list. And then you can use Google Docs to do this, by the way, because then everybody with a Gmail account can share and read and sign up. And it's very much easier than trying to um, send a piece of paper or even use a Word doc attachment. So you can allow each of you to pick the tasks that you feel that your skill sets match up to. So for instance, you may have a next door neighbor who's very chatty and loves to have tea and scones and so wouldn't it be nice if you could take your loved one over there or, you know, ask the person, could you, could you have tea and scones with my wife or with my husband while I'm, you know, doing grocery store and, and that type of thing. And so that's, you know, that gives you the opportunity to get away and do what you need to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, find somebody else who walks their dog and say, would you mind if uh, my father walked with you um, because he loves dogs and he needs exercise? And that will give your dad a chance to not feel like you're telling him, you need to walk, you need exercise. That's what we adult children, we parent or try to parent our parents. They hate it and they're gonna resist. So that's gonna create more frustration. Instead say, hey, I talked to the neighbor and they need help. You know, they need someone to walk with them to, to walk the dog. And it gives them a sense of purpose and it gives them a sense of um, a reason to walk. And they know the dog needs to be walked. So they're going to get, push themselves to do that as opposed to you telling them what to do. See the difference? Now, the other thing is there can be misunderstandings between family members. So please write down, okay, you said you were gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And let's just update the plan. If things, if things don't look like you can actually complete your commitment, let us know as soon as possible. And that, that will resolve some of the family dynamics that occur during caregiving. And then remember, you're not the only one who can do things. So, um, it, it, it's very hard on spouses. And I hear a lot of spouses tell me, 
Well, when we did our wedding vows, we said till death do us part. True, but you weren't counting on this particular situation. Till death do us part really means I'm going to love you and get you the best care possible for as long as I possibly can. That's what it really means. It comes from a place of love and kindness and generosity and creativity in a lot of cases. And so this is your opportunity to open up and get help, assistance, if you don't like the word help, uh, and find the resources that will help you both, right? Because you know that your loved one doesn't want anything to happen to you. And by being on this journey, you're, you kind of teed yourself up for it, right? Caregiving is really stressful. So speaking of stressful and ways to release it and, and resources that are available, Paige, could you kind of talk a bit about what um, Kelsch does for respite and how that whole thing works, please? Absolutely. I hope you can hear me okay. I had a yep. little bit of a problem with audio. but um, So I'm a huge, huge believer in respite care for all of our clients, um, especially for the ones who are struggling that are Typically, it's, it's the spouses that I work with closely that are struggling um, for placement, and they just are not ready to, to take the plunge for placement, which is absolutely fine. But however, when they're to the point where they're so stressed out, and they're starting to have, you know, difficulties with their health care themselves, I've seen caregivers pass away before their loved one. I've seen it happen more times than I'd like to see. That's why I'm, I, I, I'm a huge proponent of having um, respite care services available to, to people that can come in. And respite care is, is it's any sort of stay that's less than 30 days. So that can look like a couple different things. It can look like maybe a week, two weeks, a full day, 30 stay, 30 day stay. And also respite care can also mean day stay services, um, like hourly care. So we also do hourly care in our communities as well. And that's, it does require some registration and, um, you know, a meeting or two prior to um, getting the services, all the ducks in a row, so to speak, before someone can come. But those are ways to be able to alleviate the stress and also the frustrations um, of caring for your loved one, because this is a difficult journey. And, and you know, I, I've often heard sometimes where people say, you know, we don't always have that perfect book. However, Pam does have the perfect book. So remember that. But we don't always get handed that that planning guide to be able to say, okay, my loved one's been um, diagnosed with dementia, or I'm struggling with um, physical care needs, and I'm caring for my loved one. I just need a break. Um, I had a lady in a class that I, I meet with on Mondays, and she just said, you know, I have no happiness anymore. My husband has oh. dementia, and he's so negative. It's really sad. And she just said, you know, I have nothing to look forward to. And I said, you know what, I'm going to tell you it's okay to go and just plan a two week vacation and just do a respite and her and her daughter are going to go take a vacation and dad's going to come stay with us and he's going to be fine. He's going to yeah. be great. She's so excited. So those are, those are the types of respites you can go recharge your battery, so to speak, so you can care for your loved ones. So I highly encourage respite care. And we do that in all of our communities. All of them. Okay, good. Because I know some of them don't do, not your communities, but I know some communities don't do like the day respite or even less, anything less than two weeks. And sometimes that's too much, right? Because yeah. first of all, it's a, it's an identity theft kind of thing at the same time, right? You're feeling like my job is to be a caregiver. And now I've given away my responsibilities over to a care community. What am I going to do with my time? That people lose their identity when they become a caregiver. And to someone with dementia, you become a caregiver and not a spouse, not an adult child, not a daughter, not a son. And so that role is very puzzling to someone with dementia. And that's part of why you get resistance and professional caregivers and professionals like those at Kelsch, because my mom was at a Kelsch community for three years. And it was wonderful because I knew that she was getting the best care. She loved all of her caregivers. Shout out to Davina. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was just such a warm and wonderful relationship. And it was good for me too, because I could walk away, run my company, know that she was safe. And I'll tell you, I, I would have lost a lot of sleep 
over mom being just anywhere. And so there's that sense of finding the right place that allows you to uh, relax and, and have respite and know that they're safe. And frankly, we know he may not want to come back because he may actually be happier with activities and music and food and, you know, the dock luxury cruise liner uh, situation that we always, <laughs> we always call care communities versus going home to her. So now you've created a whole new experience where it's like, okay, now you can go visit him and you can have a life. So, you know, this stress, frustration, all these things that we're talking about that, that are surprising, you don't realize how much they penetrate your life until you don't have a life anymore. So let's, um, let's continue with the um, presentation, but, you know, you guys feel free to put anything in the chat and we'll, um, we'll stay right on top of that. Let's see, make sure. Okay, can you see that all right, Paige? Are you looking at the wrong one, it looks like? Nope, you look at the wrong one. Let me, let me share the other one. So many windows to choose from. There we go, PowerPoint presentation view. All right, oh, all right. So which one, can you see one with two boxes or are you seeing the main slide deck? I'm seeing um, the the large one, pro, uh, projects and people management. Okay, Still you're just seeing one slide. Resources in the smaller. Okay. Yeah, I see two, that one smaller. Yeah. Oh, there okay. All right, let me try one more time, guys. I appreciate your patience. Not quite sure uh, why. Uh, let's try that one. There's lots of options. There we go. That one should work. There you go. Bingo. <laughs> I had three of the same thing up on the share screen. I'm like, I don't know which one's which. <laughs> okay. So to two pages point, we, the last frustration is how do I find resources? I had one gentleman from Texas. He said, I want to talk with you. And I said, all right. And so we chatted and he said, uh, I've read uh, the 365 days book and I've read your book. And he went through some other titles of cognitive impairment books. And he said, you know, I think I'm just going to start a website and put as many resources as I can find on it. And I said, have you done a Google search for dementia care and uh, in-home care agencies and care memory care communities and National Caregivers Association and Family Caregiver Alliance. And he's like, no. And I said, well, um, those things, everything that you're talking about, there are hundreds of websites with lots of resources, depending on which part of the country you're in. And I said, so that's the good news. You don't have to create a website. <laughs> uh, but what are you looking for? And so he and I had a chat about the type of resources he was looking for. So the good news is, if you're watching this, there are plenty of resources. Take a deep breath. You're not on your own. There is absolutely no reason for you to try to do this stuff, everything about caregiving on your own. There are people out there who are trained, who are compassionate, who are connected. I think Paige and I fall into that category. We know a lot of people. Uh, and we're absolutely willing to listen and find out what it is you need in order to get you the best resources possible. But clearly this gentleman never thought about it. And he found me because my email address is in my book that says, reach out, let me know what, what, what you, you need. And so here are my, some of my suggestions and Paige, feel free to add to this list. So first of all, you're, you're doing it. Congratulations. Attend webinars and ask questions. So, so many, in so many webinars that I speak on, um, there's half the people, half the time I get a lot of questions, you know, that's like, well, what would you do in this situation? Or I'm really frustrated about this, or how does this work? And then the other half is quiet. And so I prefer the one where there's a ton of questions, <laughs> um, but I know that too, that you might be just listening to the recording and so you can't really participate. However, I think it's really important for you to know that you can always reach out. You can reply to one of the reminder emails to reach me or email me at Pam at it's not that simple.com. Paige has put her contact information a few times in the chat. So you should be able to see that uh, even on the recording. Now, the other thing is, is that you might not think about this, but 
reach out to the local care community. It, it, you know, and it can be a Kelsch community or, or another one, but you know, we like Kelsch. <laughs> Again, my mom went, had three years there and they were absolutely the best years of, of the eight that we had in memory care. And so reach out, you know, Go up to the front desk and say, I need to talk to somebody about resources, whether again, it's due to a medical situation, mobility, um, general health issues, so assisted living, or if it's cognitive impairment or starting to be cognitive impairment, all of those people in care communities can provide some sort of information just to get the ball rolling. And they also know a lot of other people who can help you, you know, have these conversations and it'll help you feel better. It'll help you. You know how your shoulders get up really close to your ears when you're stressed. Well, your, your shoulders will drop and you'll feel a bit more comfortable and you'll be able to sleep better at night as you do more research. Um, you can also just Google caregiving for an older parent or, or with, for a spouse, um, for in Phoenix or in Chicago or, you know, a suburb, whatever, wherever you're at. Um, and you will find a ton of information. Now I want to caution you with Google searches because sometimes you'll see the sponsored section up there and that's an ad for that particular, um, business. And so you want to make sure that you kind of cull through the herd. And that's the reason why, uh, that one is third and not first is that, you can get an idea, and I have a slide here with a whole bunch of resources, by the way, uh, but you can get an idea of what's available in your local area and then do some further research. The, one of the best places to start too is every state has an area agency on aging. And you can just Google area agency on aging in whatever your state is, and you'll get a list. And then you can just call that number and say, here's my situation, what can I do? And they will put you in touch with all the resources that you could possibly need. And then you can also, just a thought, ask somebody who's actually an expert on the topic. And that would be me in my case. But um, it, it's different, especially with memory care. When you talk with a person who's been through the journey for 14 years, they have a different perspective. First of all, we're calm because we've already been through it. But we also understand the emotions. We understand the challenges, the decisions that you're going to have to make. And with my background, what I do is really help you evaluate which decision might be the best for you that you're going to, and by best, I mean the most comfortable. What's going to help you do well through this journey so that you don't have guilt or regret? Because ultimately, when your loved one is gone, but, or when you're gone, you, you don't want anybody to look back on this journey and say, oh, it was terrible and, and we shouldn't have done this and we shouldn't have done that. And there's no reason to do that to yourself. You know what? And, and if you feel like you've made mistakes in the past, then let your, give yourself some grace, right? Because you're doing the best you can. That's the bottom line. You are doing the best you can with the resources that you have in the time that you have. And we get, as caregivers, we beat ourselves up quite a bit. So being an overwhelmed caregiver, hello guilt. So how you think about things determines your success in handling how you, when you feel overwhelmed. Mindset is critical to caregiving. So if you're constantly beating yourself up, you're going to feel guilty. I have a client who, who visits her mom every day. And I don't advise that because it, it's going to be very difficult when her mom progresses for her to detach and restart her life. And the flip side of that is she, she wants to get, have as much time with her mom as she possibly can. So those are the type of conversations we have where, is there a balance? You know, are you giving up too much or is it just the right amount? And it's unique to every single person. So you have to look at not judging yourself. And if you have someone with dementia or cognitive impairment, then you're looking at someone who can trigger a lot of, of emotions in you, sadness, grief, happiness, 
I mean, you name it, you're all over the place. I call it the emotional roller coaster. And so you kind of have to step back and go, okay, again, let it go. And do you want to be happy or do you want to be right? So, and then my other favorite question, which I think uh, I got from a business uh, author, business book author, and he was talking about making mistakes within uh, being an entrepreneur. And he's like, well, will this thing, well, sending out the wrong email or having the wrong Zoom link um, actually be a big deal a year from now? I was like, no, not even a big deal a week from now. Uh, so you have to have perspective because we tend to hold ourselves to a high standard, one of perfection and doing everything right. And in reality, if it doesn't matter a year from now or two years from now or five years from now or 10 years from now, whatever, whatever your favorite number is, um, then why are you hung up on it? Why are you feeling overwhelmed? Uh, why are you feeling guilty? Because guilt is one of those evasive emotions where we tend to default to it. It's like, well, I should have gotten there on time. I feel really badly, you know, or, you know, I knew there was something I could have done, but I didn't, or I should have gotten my healthcare POA, but I didn't. So now I feel horrible, right? So guilt comes through in a lot of different ways, but most of it is negative or all of it is negative in my opinion. Remember to take one step at a time. When you have a loved one who has cognitive impairment specifically, they live in the moment. There's no before moment and there's no after moment for the most part. They're living right there. So when they see a dog and their face lights up, that's that moment. They have a moment of joy. Enjoy it with them. It's okay. And if the dog comes up and puts its feet on your loved one, don't yell at the dog because you watch your loved one's reaction. If they grab the dog and hug it, wonderful. Because you know, your initial reaction is trying to control that outcome, which we talked about at the very beginning. So that's, that's the reason why it's so important to take one step at a time, live in the moment, accept that you are doing the best that you can with the knowledge that you have. And then remember, and this is hard, everybody answers the question correctly, but they don't actually internalize it and change their behavior. So your loved one would not want you to give up your life just to take care of them and will give up their, give up your relationships. So I have a client whose um, mother is, um, has a memory care issues and is a cognitive impairment and dementia. And she is really demanding of the daughter but the daughter has a daughter and she also has kids. So she's got grandkids and they've told her, you know, how, why is it we never see you? Why are you always, you know, taking time with great grandma and not with us? So there gets to be some resentment there. And so it's really important to look at the balance of all of your relationships in your life and, and, and know that when you have a community like uh, Kelsch communities, across the country, it allows you to get a break and build those relationships back because it is difficult. You know, you always, we always pivot towards the person who has the greatest need, not realizing that we're turning our back on the other relationships. And that's just sad. So that's actually why Paige and I are in this business is to, to help you not, not end up in that situation. So here are the tips I promised to take some of the complexity out of caregiving. So first, evaluate the situation objectively as much as you can and look at it from physically, emotionally, cognitively, see where they're at. And that can change from morning to afternoon. So they may be really chipper and you're like, oh, well, we'll go to the park this afternoon. But by afternoon, you know, they might be tired. They might be cranky. Um, some, they could have had a bad memory. And now you want to go to the park and they're not in the same mood they were in. So respect it and say, all right, we'll go to the park another day. Don't hold on to that. Again, don't hold on to that outcome. Don't hold on to trying to control plans, right? Especially if you have someone with cognitive impairment, but even physical impairment, medical impairment, sometimes people just don't feel well. And you've got to respect that no matter how much you wanted to go to the park. That's the tough part, guys. Um, and if nothing else, it's okay to step away and regroup 
And that's when you bring in uh, an in-home care agency or you go do the, the um, day respite with couch because honestly, an hour is not enough. Two hours isn't enough. You need to really step away, know that your loved one is safe and cared for, probably having a really good time, by the way, uh, with all the music and entertainment that happens and food. Oh, my, my mom's favorite was uh, chocolate brownie sundaes. And she used to get those at least once a week over at Rock Creek. And so she had moments of joy. I had moments of stress and that was my fault. She wasn't putting stress on me. The community wasn't putting stress on me. I was, that's a choice that we make. So if, if I could go back, you know, people always say, well, if you could go back and do it over again, how would you do it? I would be a lot nicer to me. I would be much easier on myself realizing that I'm doing the best that I can. And sometimes that's really hard to accept. And I understand that, but it's something that it's, it's critical to your sanity and to your health. And then avoid assumptions about how others handle situations, right? Because a lot of times we, we think, oh, well, you know, that's how that's going, or this is, this is what somebody else is doing. And we have these broad generalizations and these assumptions, assumptions are bad things. There's a reason why they make a joke about don't never assume um, because people think differently, they behave differently. And you may not, especially if you're dealing with someone with cognitive impairment, you may as assume one thing and there's another thing going on, like a UTI. Um, and then how others handle that um, might, might create some angst and might create some frustration. In reality, because other people do things differently doesn't make them wrong. Um, sometimes when we get so wound up within our hearts about our loved ones, uh, it's really hard to let go and let somebody else be right. And I think that that's a really challenging thing for all of us to do, especially when you're stressed out as a caregiver. So get help, read. There's lots of books and blogs. Uh, Google search for credible resources and sources ask questions of others who have experienced the same journey you're on. Um, you know, it, it depends. Not everybody's a support group person. I do dementia Q and A. So if you have questions on dementia, I will answer them and give you ideas for a path forward. Support groups are family members helping each other and telling, sharing stories. So it's really up to you and you can do both or you could do neither. But the point is, is to have somebody to talk with about the situation. And then enlist, enlist professional help. That can be in-home caregiving agencies. I strongly recommend you use an agency and not a private person, unless that's someone that your family has used for ages um, for many different reasons. But one of them, uh, what I consider to be probably one of the most important is that if a person isn't available and you need someone at a specific time, so you're going to a doctor's appointment, and that person can't make it, you have to cancel the doctor's appointment. It could have been a really important doctor's appointment. With an income care agency, they will back, provide backup for that. So you, you never have to worry about that. And then of course, if you have a doctor's appointment and you'd like to go out for coffee or go golf or, or go for a walk in the park, call up your local Kelch community and see you know, what they have for uh, a day stay. And so these are just ways that you can get help and assistance without wearing yourself down because that's not what we want. So if you're wondering, you know, when, when do I have a, a change in, in life? You know, what, when do I know that something big is, is, is on the horizon? It's, you know, make sure that you build that trigger event plan where if somebody falls, what happens? If somebody gets pneumonia, what happens? If somebody goes into the hospital and then they have to go to rehab, what happens? Uh, just having that conversation and kind of working through it is now as opposed to when it actually happens, because you will be crazy panicked when it happens. So we need to get you while you're you know, calmer and thinking logically. So that's why we talk about trigger event plans. And then every time something does happen, it's important that you take a look at it and, and evaluate the plan and make sure that it's still on track. And then watch for age-related decline. That could be hearing loss, short-term memory loss, mobility issues, chronic disease, weight loss, or weight gain. 
And then also something that we tend not to look for, and we should, is socialization and stimulation. When those start to decline, it shows that there's something wrong with the individual. Either they don't want to interact because they can't, they've noticed they have memory issues, they're embarrassed, they might be incontinent. Those are triggers. Those are things that we need to pay attention to. So if you're an adult child or a spouse and you notice any of these things, you know, reach out and, and get some help. And then lastly, remember, you do not have to take this journey alone. You know, you don't need to learn all the skills and try to toilet or shower someone when they don't want it. There are people out there who know how to get your loved one to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. I had one gentleman who wanted to shower his wife every day. And I said, what did she do? Go play in the mud? I said, why would you do that to both of you? Goodness gracious. I said, twice a week is plenty. And he's like, oh, I never thought of that. So there you go. So here are some resources to help you. National Alliance for Caregiving, Family Caregiver Alliance. My book has a bunch of uh, resources listed in the back. Uh, if you have someone with dementia, the ALZ Foundation, um, Alzheimer's Foundation of America is great for caregivers. It's very specific to caregivers. Alzheimer's Association has tons of research and information to answer your questions. Area Agency on Aging per state, just look for the .org to make sure you're getting the state agency, in-home care agencies, and of course, our favorite, care community seminars and events. And that means me and Paige. So to wrap up, holding space. This is what we need to do. It means that we're walking, willing to walk alongside another person in whatever journey they're on. Key, part, key point here, without judging them, making them feel inadequate. Oh, I can't tell you how, how heartbreaking it is to watch someone talk to someone with dementia and make them feel like they're really inadequate. Trying to fix them, another one, or trying to impact the outcome. We, when we hold space for other people, we open our hearts, offer unconditional support, and let go of judgment and control. And that's courtesy of Heather Plett, who is the author of The Art of Holding Space. So I promised you I would give you a gift if you made it all the way through the webinar. Uh, and um, basically, if you would like to meet with me for free for 30 minutes, I am happy to answer your questions, point you in the direction of resources, and do whatever you would what talk where, about whatever you would like to um, for 30 minutes, and then we'll go from there. So this is that was all of my contact information. The easiest thing is to just email me at pam at it's not that simple.com and we'll set that time up. And that is all I have, Paige. Um, you know, we've got our next uh, webinar on June 1st. So everybody mark your calendars. And please watch for an email uh, with the list again, but also we're going to ask you to, to uh, we're going to survey everyone to find out what the best time is uh, in order to make sure that we get the most attendance so we can talk to you guys live. Absolutely. Okay. Anything you, else? Pam. You good, Paige? I think I'm good. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for attending or watching the recording. We appreciate it. Again, reach out to uh, Paige at pfg at kelshsenior.com uh, or to me at pam at it's not that simple.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Take care and thanks again for watching. Thank you. Bye bye.